It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome in to another edition of Musso at the box. LSU getting set for a massive three-game weekend at Minute Maid Park in Houston, Texas at the Astros Foundation College Classic. They will face Texas on Friday night, ULL on Saturday night, and Texas State at 3 p.m. on Sunday. And then LSU uh, will head home and uh, get set to start their final pre-conference week but before we get there we have to get through this weekend and i'm fired up we got a lot to preview y'all and there's a couple reasons i'm fired up number one it's a big weekend facing a lot of good teams uh number two it's the last weekend where we have to preview multiple teams so that that for me uh as much as i love digging up all this stuff and as much as i love the game of baseball it will be nice uh here soon to just be previewing uh you know one team per weekend but uh until we get there, we got uh, three great matchups for LSU. They're going to be tested an awful lot, and we've talked a lot about that here on previous episodes, how much LSU will be tested, not just from being away from home and being in a different type of environment than your home crowd and, and the friendly confines of Alec Box Stadium with all the amenities and, and everything of that nature, sleeping in your own bed, all of that kind of stuff, uh, but also facing three very good teams and see if LSU can keep things on track. They're eight and one right now, coming off a huge win over Rice in Wednesday's uh, contest. And uh, of course, their first true road game of the season. So that was about as great as it could start out. Let's see if they can keep that rolling here now as they go into this one. Uh, so look, we're going to jump right into it. Smash the like button. Get subscribed to the podcast on the podcast apps. Get subscribed to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Share it out. All of that is greatly, greatly appreciated. Excuse me. All right. Um, quick note as well. Uh, if you want to, if you want to watch the games, maybe you've heard this by now. If not, you haven't, or let me just be the latest, uh, to tell you. So all the games, not just LSU's, all the games in the Astros foundation classic here will be streamed live without a paywall on Astros.com on the Astros, uh, Twitter page, Facebook, and the YouTube channel. So you have plenty, plenty of, of options, uh, to view these games for free, which is which is great. There's also uh, the Space City Home Network, uh, which is a, a the Astros channel. It's available in the entirety of the five state viewing area, but it is only available on Directv, AT and T, Uverse, Xfinity, uh, Consolidated Communications, and other things that I haven't heard of. Astound, uh, Phonoscope, iNet. So look, your best option probably the YouTube channel. Everyone's got YouTube. It's free or Astros.com, all of that. That's your best option. That's where you can find the games this weekend. All right, let's dive in. Let's start with the big one. Uh, LSU uh, versus number 15, Texas. That's 7 p.m. on Friday night, Minute Maid Park. 7 p.m., of course, tentative. It's a tournament. Who knows how long uh, these things go. I mean, the last time LSU was here, they played the, the second game of the day against Oklahoma, and they went 11 innings, and that pushed the Texas-Tennessee game way back, way back. Um, but ten, tentative start, 7 o'clock for LSU in Texas on Friday night. Texas leads the overall series with LSU 28-14 and 1. LSU of course won the last meeting 3 to nothing in Austin last season on the Gavin Dugas three-run homer in the top of the ninth. There should be some similarities uh to that ball game when when you look at this and one of them is Texas projected starting pitcher David Pierce has not announced a starting pitcher for Texas, but I would be absolutely floored if it is anybody other than LeBaron Johnson. Yes, you should remember him. Big righty with a huge fastball, 95. In that game last year against LSU, he was up to 97-98 with the heater. It's a wipeout breaking ball that is hard as well. 87 to maybe 89 miles per hour with the breaking ball. So, 
He struck out nine in his appearance against LSU last season in five shutout innings. He was awesome and has been awesome so far this year. And look, it was it was expected. I mean, not only is he named a you know a, a preseason All American, he was obviously preseason Big Twelve this year and the preseason Big Twelve Pitcher of the Year. They're expecting massive things out of LeBaron Johnson, and so far have gotten them. In his last start, he's coming off against coming off eight shutout innings against Cal Poly. So, man, look, he is rolling. So, uh, again, I will be floored if it is anybody other than LeBaron Johnson Jr. facing LSU uh, on Friday night. It'll be his third appearance, third start. He's 1-0 with an ERA of 1.38. 13 13 innings pitched, walked four, struck out 14. The opponent hitting 175 off of LeBaron Johnson Jr., As for LSU, that's where we will break away from the Texas preview conversation momentarily and talk more specifically about how LSU sets up their rotation. Because look, ever since you know the uh, the end of last week or the end of the previous weekend for LSU, where they played Northern Illinois and Stony Brook, a lot of people have asked, you know, will LSU keep Thatcher Hurd? in the Friday spot, in that number one spot in the rotation. And if you move him out of there, who slides in to that spot? And what do you do with Thatcher Hurd after? Or if if you move him out of there, what do you do with him after that? Uh, Jay Johnson has not announced a starting pitcher. For what it's worth, no team in this event has, at least none of the three that LSU's playing. I don't know what Vanderbilt and Houston have done. But uh, so... We're kind of in the dark there. Um, we've talked plenty about what LSU could do. I will tell you right now, I think it's either one of two people on Friday. It's either going to be Gage Jump. It is either going to be Thatcher Hurd. It is one of those two guys. I'm very, very confident that they will not move Luke Holman and that he will start on Saturday, and I think that's that's great. So the conversation we're looking at here is really, is it going to be Gage Jump or Thatcher Hurd? It all just depends on if they're ready to throw jump in that role. I've told y'all here plenty, plenty that I think Gage Jump will ultimately be LSU's Friday night starter this season. It's not a slight on Thatcher Hurd. I think he's more than capable of doing it. He has Friday night stuff when he's going at his best. We know that. I actually don't think he's pitched as badly as some of the line shows on him this year. But Gage Jump, it just looks different. It just looks Friday. Everything about it looks Friday, the way the ball jumps out of his hand, uh, you know, and, and doing it from the left side, the cool, calm, and collectiveness that he has on the mound. Everything about it just screams game one. And eventually, I think he ends up in that role. You already saw him once at the front of the rotation, and that was against Northern Illinois in that uh, four-game weekend against the Huskies and then Stony Brook. And you saw him extend a good bit. Got to 52 pitches. That's awesome. So I think, sure, having him already at the front of the rotation, that could have been a signal that they're saying, okay, this is the time we want to do it. That's the other thing we've talked about with Jump is, and we've compared it to Thatcher Hurd in 2023, where they brought him along, brought him along. He's coming off injury, brought him along, brought him along, brought him along. And it was when it was time, when they wanted to really get that pitching set up, they moved him into the rotation and, and let him stay there until after, I believe, it was the Tennessee week, and that part's inconsequential. Um, and I've been telling you, I think they're going to do the same thing with Gage Jump, and maybe that was the tip of the hand last week where, okay, we got a four-game week in here. Let's get him in the, in the front of the rotation, extend him a little bit, have him go to the bullpen after that, throw some more to get the pitch count up uh, even higher, and see what happens against Texas. It'd be very easy to keep him in that spot and – on an extra day's rest and try to extend him even more. If that's what they do, the logical answer is to move Thatcher Hurd to Sunday. And then you you have Javen Coleman available in the bullpen if you want, which would be great. But again, they they haven't. It, it wouldn't, I mean, it could very well be Thatcher Hurd. He faced this Texas team last year and pitched very well. I mean, through five shutout innings, of his own uh, against the Longhorns. And that was really the first time we saw it from Thatcher Hurd. Like, okay, there is something really special in there. So uh, I will say this, regardless of who goes for LSU, regardless of who goes for LSU on Friday, 
I want to see them extend. So if it, you know, if it's heard, he got over 90 pitches last week. Can you get him a little deeper than that? Can he go over 100 or at least keep it there at 90, you know, 93, I think is what he threw. And if it's gauge jump, that's going to be really exciting. He got you through two and a third, got to 52 pitches, I believe it was. Let's see, I actually probably have it in front of me. Um, uh, as I fumble through all of this, I don't. Sorry, it's actually the one box score I didn't have. Um, but I think he got you to 52 pitches. Can he get you up to 60, 65, maybe through four, maybe into the fifth inning against a Texas lineup that's hitting the cover off the ball here early in the season, which we're going to get into momentarily. I want to see how either of those guys handle the moment as well. That's something I want. Like a guy like Thatcher Hurd, this weekend should not face him. We've seen him do this in Omaha, right? I mean, on, on the biggest stage that this sport of college baseball has to offer, and he was awesome. You know, in all of those outings. So this shouldn't face him, but you still want to see how he reacts. It's a different year. It's a different team. And the same definitely goes for a guy like Gage Jump. So it's going to be one of those two guys. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if it was either. Yeah, I will say it does set up very nicely. I've, I've, we kind of mentioned it. Having Jump at the front of the rotation last week to potentially just move him a day back and then, you know, find where you want to place Thatcher heard. So look, it's going to be those three guys. At some point this season, it's going to be those three guys. And for what it's worth, Jay Johnson, when he met with the media uh prior to the, you know, uh this was on Thursday when he met with the media and a, a hat tip to Michael Cobble at WBRZ for uh, you know, being down there already and, and and tweeting this out, uh this this audio out so we could we could have it here. Um and it was actually Cobble that asked the question. Is Jay Johnson ready to start setting his rotation up ahead of SEC play? Yeah, I do. But, you know, it's the 56-game playoff thing. Still, that's still a ways out for me. But the same things you need to do then are the things that you need to do now. And I don't know that it's about setting it up because the order that they go in doesn't necessarily matter. Um, it's the execution. And so we'll pay attention to all that, you know, for bumping a guy up, pulling a guy back, pitch counts. I mean, obviously, we're bringing some guys along in pitch counts. It's just it's not as clean a start from, hey, we're, this is what we're doing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But don't forget, I mean, last year, best college baseball team in the last 20 years. Like, I mean, Ty Floyd came out of the pen the first two weekends and then started every Saturday after that. So I don't think we're in any territory like myself or the pitchers involved are unfamiliar with. So there you go. I mean, yeah, he says, I, I would like to set it up. It's not time. The thing that he said in there that we've been saying really since the preseason as well is LSU's finally in a position this year on the mound starting wise that it really doesn't. It, it, as long as they're pitching to their capability, you can really put all of them on on any day, um, and it, and it should work out. I just think the favored uh, rotation for them at some point this season is Gage Jump, Luke Coleman, Thatcher Hurd. We'll see. I mean, what a luxury that would be to have a guy like Thatcher Hurd uh, on a Sunday who won who was a winning pitcher in a national championship game. There's You're the only team in the country who could say that. So that'd be an awesome luxury. We'll see how they go. But that's what I want to see from whichever of those two guys, Hurd or, or Jump, starts on uh, on Friday night versus Texas. So let's shift back now to a little bit more on the Texas Longhorns. As I said, they're 7-1 and one so far on the season. Texas has a series victory over San Diego, uh, a series sweep over Cal Poly, and two midweek wins uh, over Houston Christian and St. John's. They have not played the best competition. Of course not. It's early in the season. You can argue that LSU hasn't uh, either. Players to watch. Let's start in the, uh, in the batting lineup for the Longhorns. Uh, as a team right now, they're hitting 329, 13 homers, so a good bit of pop for Texas, especially considering the ballpark they play at at Dish Falk Field. Um, and they, they've even run a little bit, in which they normally will play a, a little bit more of a smaller ball, but with the, the ball flying like it is for them early here, uh, not maybe as much, uh, you know, uh, small ball being played there. Um, we're going to start with Peyton Powell. Uh, and man, Peyton Powell is off to a rocket, uh, rocket start, man. 
red red shirt senior, so a very veteran player. He's hitting 441 so far. He started all eight games. Leads the, well, I should say, he's tied for the team lead in home runs with four, and he leads the team with 18 RBI. So he's been a force in the middle of that lineup and definitely a guy that LSU will have to circle uh, when when going through this lineup is, uh, is Peyton Powell. I mean, he is... He's been awesome. I mean, like I said, leading in two categories and hitting over 400. Great, great start for him. Uh, Jared Thomas is the leading hitter on this Texas team at 581. Also off to a great start, obviously there. Um, and then I, I want to circle on uh, on Jalen Flores as well. So Flores is into his sophomore campaign, very highly touted out of high school, coming into Texas last year as a freshman, just struggled to adapt to the college game. Not so much this year. 344 on the year for Flores, the second guy on the team with four home runs, tying Powell for that lead, and he's second on the team with 12 RBI. And a lot of those home runs that Flores has hit have been to take the lead late in a ball game. Very much a flair for the dramatic from him early. So those two guys, so Jared Thomas, your leading hitter overall for Texas in eight games, 581. Peyton Powell, Jalen Flores, the middle of the order guys that you must circle who have been driving the ball out of the park and driving in a lot of runs for Texas. And then one other guy that I really want to zero in on is Will Gasparino. So Will Gasparino is a true freshman outfielder for Texas. He was the Big 12 preseason freshman of the year. So they're expecting massive things from him. And he's a big kid, 6'6", 210. You talk about, you know, fill out the uniform, what they look like. That's Will Gasparino. And living up to that preseason hype, he is off to a great start, hitting 360 and has already driven in seven RBIs. Uh, that was very redundant. Already has seven RBIs. So that's definitely something to watch there uh, as well. Circle him, big outfielder for Texas. Uh, Porter Brown's the other guy I would I would tell you. He was preseason all Big 12, but is really off to a, a slow start, but definitely has it, uh, has it in there. So you're looking at, again, a Texas lineup that hasn't faced the best competition yet so far this season, but is also off to a scorching hot start. So for LSU's pitchers, they're really going to have to be on their game, on their game going up against Texas. And if you if you uh you know if you do go with a guy like Jump, you might not get as long of an outing out of him. So it's going to be imperative on the bullpen. So a guy like Nate Ackenhausen could be huge in that game against Texas. Whereas uh, you've seen a lot of um a, a lot of extended relief early in the season for Ack. That's something to keep an eye on there uh, as well. On the mound for Texas, look, the Longhorns are always going to have great pitching. We talked a lot about LeBaron Johnson already. Um, there are definitely some guys to highlight here. Texas, keeping in mind the competition, is pitching to a team ERA of 1.82 right now. They've struck out 73 and 74 innings, so maybe not overpowering stuff. Right now that you that you might be used to seeing from Texas, but David Pierce, like I said, he's a pitching coach by trade. He's always going to have a solid staff, and that he does. So a couple guys to highlight at the back end of the bullpen. We'll start with Gage Bohm. He's been, you know, uh, he's got the only save of the season so far from Texas, and he's a he's a real guy. It's going to be a live arm, obviously for him. Uh, four appearances, tied for the team lead. Uh, is a guy like Gage Bohm. The ERA a little elevated, just below four, but uh, it, he's he's had a, a really one poor outing um, on the year that's that, that's elevating that. He, he gave up two earned against San Diego. He hasn't given up a run in e any of his other uh, any of his other three outings on the season there. So uh, really good stuff. From a guy like Gage Bohm, again, going to be at the back end of the bullpen. The other guy who will be at the back end of the bullpen is David Shaw. He's got three appearances on the year, and all of them have really come in the later stage. He's yet to give up a run. The opponent's hitting just 200 off of him. He's been very, very good when called upon. Uh, a name that should be familiar to LSU fans is Grant Fontenot. Of course, Grant Fontenot started his career at LSU, redshirted in 2022. He was the number one player in the state of Louisiana in the class of 2021, 
right-handed arm, going to be in the low 90s. Uh, got a slider and a changeup as well. He also has four appearances out of the bullpen for Texas and has pitched very well for them, has yet to give up a run. A nice uh, strikeout-to-walk ratio as well, and they've used him uh, more towards the middle of the game, so definitely keep that in mind as well. And the last guy out of the bullpen that I really want to hone in on for Texas is a freshman Easton Tumas, and the reason I want to highlight him, three appearances, so they've used him plenty, but of the guys who have strictly appeared out of the bullpen, Tumas has the most innings. Now, it's five and two-thirds. It's still early in the season, but they've obviously used him in a, in a long, um, you know, a longer relief role. Um, big stock righty, fastball, uh, you know, Going to be high 80s, low 90s, probably about 88, 92 or so for from Easton Tumas, and just a guy that they've they've really called on early. So uh, I and it'd be I'll, I'll be very curious to see if they put him in a game against LSU or whenever they put him in a game uh, out there in Houston, how he responds on that stage as a freshman. So uh, Texas, they also field the ball incredibly well. I mean, they they look like a very formidable opponent here so far early in the season, fielding at nine. nine 978, the great team ERA, the great team batting average, a 7 and 1 record. They'll get their first they'll get their biggest test of the season too against LSU, just like LSU will get their biggest test against the Texas Longhorns uh to to start this season. This has been a game in this tournament that has been played often and has just drawn massive crowds and I expect the same on um on uh on Friday night. Let's move to Saturday, shall we, where LSU will face off with in-state rival ULL at a 7 p.m. first pitch on Saturday. Again, temporary. That's what we're thinking, right? And for me, I just fully believe that's going to be Luke Holman on the bump for LSU, and, and he's been awesome, y'all. 2-0. Uh, he's... This will be there'd be his third start, twelve and a third. He's walked one and struck out eighteen, and the opponent's hitting just one twenty five off of Luke Holman. So I, I'm I'm very intrigued to see him get back out there on the bump. And again, like I said, I firmly believe that will be Saturday against ULL. Um, and just I mean, keep doing what you're doing. I want to see if they mix in the secondary stuff a little bit more. You did see a better feel for the curveball in his last start against Northern Illinois. Or excuse me, yes, in his last start against Northern Illinois. Can you build off of that, and can he keep the same efficiency that he's had? I mean, he's he really could have gone complete game uh, in that game against Northern Illinois if it weren't you know late February. He would have had a, a great chance to do that. So can he keep that efficiency? Uh, when I look at ULL from a lineup standpoint um i mean i'll I'll be quite honest they they haven't really impressed numbers wise they got a couple guys in there that can hit and and they definitely have a one guy in particular who has a history he's just off to a bit of a slow start but when you look at the cajuns offensively they're hitting 261 as a team right now 10 homers so a little bit of pop there uh and will run a little bit 14 steal attempts so far in eight games so uh they've they've been a, a little bit active on the base pass playing a good league obviously in the sun belt uh, and were picked, uh, let's see, I got it here. They were picked to finish uh, fourth in the Sun Belt Conference this year and actually got two first-place votes. Uh, so Matt Deggs looks like he has a pretty solid staff, uh, excuse me, a pretty solid uh, club coming in uh, this year. Trey LaFleur is the leading hitter so far for the Cajuns. He's played in seven of their eight games, hitting 526, two home runs, just second on the team right now. He's also second with seven RBIs. You've seen him in the lineup a lot more recently. Didn't kind of start the year there, but has really been a mainstay and obviously expect to see him. Uh, Josh Alexander is the other 300 hitter in this lineup at 308. And then you have to go a ways to really find somebody else. I mean, Kyle DeBarge is who we're going to focus in on because just of the history that he has. Preseason All-American was the leading hitter last year for ULL at 371 and was named the Sunbelt Conference Preseason Player of the Year. So preseason All-American, preseason All-Sunbelt, preseason Player of the Year in the Sunbelt. Just off to a bit of a slow start this year is Kyle DeBarge. Uh, and he, led, like I said, led them in hitting last year, and that was with missing 11 games uh, due to injury. But slower start this year at 242 is the barge, but does lead them with three home runs and does lead them with 10 RBI. So while the average isn't there, the rest of the production is, and I mean, he is the star in that lineup to circle. Let's move to the bump uh, for ULL. 
I'll be real curious to see who they start against LSU. So their number two so far through the first two weeks of the season has been freshman lefty Chase Morgan. He comes very highly touted uh, out of high school. Great size, a Texas native, uh, and and really good stuff. It just hasn't totally you know come to fruition for him early in his career. So far, you look at it, two starts, 0-1 record, an ERA of six, has just gone six innings, uh, six runs, four of those earned, and the opponent's hitting 308. If they wanted to make a change there, I would imagine they would just move Carson Fluno up a day in the rotation, but we'll see. You know, I mean, they, they might just keep it as is. Uh, the only reason I say that they have, the only reason I say they might make a change, and again, I have, this is a strictly a guess, is... Their first games in this are Vanderbilt and LSU. You might want to have your two best guys going. Jack Martinez is going to be their Friday guy. He's actually got premium stuff. Carson Fluno has been great on Sunday. Do you move him up a day potentially to face LSU and, and try to get two big wins for your resume, obviously, early in the season? And I, I believe they play, um, let's see, I, actually, I have their schedule here. Uh, they play for their first third game this weekend in Houston they play Houston so do you want to you know maybe let uh Morgan ease in there I'm not sure for me it'll either be Morgan or Fluno uh that LSU is facing other guys to keep an eye on uh for ULL out of the bullpen let's start again at the back end and you have Matthew Holzhammer which is a great name obviously three appearances uh, which is tied for second on the uh on the team he's got the one save Definitely a back-end guy. So out of the three appearances, just three and two-thirds. They're not going to extend him very much. But good stuff. Sh can strike you out. Hasn't walked anybody, but has struck out six. And the opponent's hitting just 077 against uh, against Holzhammer. He's, uh, man, he's he's been awesome uh, so far to this point. Uh, the other guy, I got to make sure I get his name right here. The other guy at the back end of the, bull, of the bullpen is L.P. Langevin, LP Langevin, uh, at the back end of the bullpen, he has the other save, also three appearances. Uh, they have extended him a little bit more, seven innings in those three appearances, but a good strikeout guy as well with 12. The walk number, a little high, six and seven, so control can be an issue a little bit there with Langevin, but the opponent not hitting him, just 160 average. The other big name to watch out of the bullpen for ULL is uh, lefty Stephen Cash. He has been awesome, leads them in appearances with four, has punched out 11 uh, in five and two-thirds, so it's good strikeout stuff uh, there from him, and uh, you're looking at a... Um, a 111 batting average against. So they're a pretty left-handed heavy staff. Uh, ULL is, which which will be interesting. LSU hasn't faced many lefties this year, so that's something I would actually love to see them do, uh, you know, is, is get out there and, and face some left-handed pitching, and, and ULL can certainly provide that. Uh, in the field, the Cajuns are not great. Uh, they've They've really kicked it around. Uh, so far this season, I'm, they're fielding in the 960s. Uh, it's, forgive me, it's not loading, but they're fielding in the 960s. I, I at least remember that. I was going to get you the exact number. So that's something to definitely keep an eye on in a game that can be tightly contested. Who, which team can make the plays? LSU, outside of the game against Rice, has really, really fielded well. LSU comes in to this weekend series fielding 981 as a ball club. That is really, really elite stuff. Uh, from LSU on on the mound. All right, let's look at Texas State here. Uh, this will be the fourth meeting all time with Texas State. LSU leads that series for uh, three nothing. Is a really good mid major team out of the Sun Belt. They were picked to finish fourth, right behind ULL, just to prove how good of a mid major this group is. Uh, two years ago in 2022, they were two and zero in the Stanford Regional and had to be beaten twice. They got to the regional final. Stanford ultimately did come back and beat them twice, but uh, it's a it's a good mid major club, and there's there's plenty of pop throughout the lineup. Up. with with their pitching that's going to be something interesting to see again with LSU if it's not whichever guy doesn't start on Friday is going to start this game that that's what I believe um so uh for for the for the Bobcats for Texas State excuse me I, 
I don't expect them to make any type of change to their starting rotation just because all three of their guys have really struggled. Uh, when I look at their pitching staff as a whole, it's a four ERA just above four. Uh, really good strikeout uh, number, 84 and 67 innings as a, as a team, and the opponent's just hitting 224. So as a staff, they've been great, but the success has really come out of the bullpen. Their starting rotation has struggled. So I imagine it will still just be Peyton Zabel. Uh, excuse me, Peyton Zabel, uh, redshirt senior righty, big body, 6'7", so, I mean, talk about stock righty, uh, but he struggled. This would be his third start. He's only pitched five innings in two starts, and the ERA is north of seven. So uh, he's been shelled. He's got more walks than strikeouts, but if they are going to make a change in their rotation, it's going to be somebody who has not made a start uh, this year or or a midweek guy or, or something like that. So I'm expecting it to actually just be Peyton Zabel facing LSU on um, – on Sunday, excuse me, um, guys to keep an eye out for in the bullpen for Texas State, Tyler C, uh, four innings, but he has, he's only thrown, excuse me, four appearances, but he's only thrown two innings, he hasn't thrown a full inning in any of those four appearances, they use him very much as a matchup guy, but he's been extremely effective, uh, he hadn't given up a hit this year, and he also hasn't given up a run, obviously by proxy, the other guy with four appearances is Otto Wolford, He's a uh, big right-handed senior pitcher as well. He's been great. Five innings, seven punch-outs in those five innings, an ERA south of two, and a uh, batting average against of one uh, one one eight of one eighteen. What am I saying? Um, so I mean, that's just two guys right there. We could easily go deeper. I mean, a guy like Rhett McC uh, a guy like Rhett McCafferty is the only other guy I would really really highlight. Uh, another good uh, strikeout to walk ratio, no walks, eight punch outs and four and a third, three appearances and a, another batting average against south of uh, of two uh, south of 200. And uh, Drayton Brown has been kind of a longer relief guy for them, just two appearances, but five and two thirds. Uh, and Brown is a another big righty, so uh, more right handed pitching, but another batting average uh, south. Of, uh, of 200 so the bullpen looks really really good for Texas State the starting pitching not so much so jump them early they field the ball very well like Texas fielding 978 coming in let's wrap things up on Texas State with their batting order and we will start there with Ryan Farber true freshman all everything for them so far he's been great 556 8 RBI, that has him second on the team. He really jump starts everything. He's going to hit at the top of their order and play center field. He's a really, really awesome player for Texas State. August Ramirez is their DH, hitting 429, leading the team with, or I should say, tied for the lead with three homers, tied for the lead with nine RBI, so a big bat there in the middle. Alec Patino is the other guy with nine RBIs there in the middle. And then uh, Aaron Lugo is the other guy with three homers uh, there. At any point, Texas State could send a lineup out there with five guys hitting 300 or higher. And if they wanted to put Dalen Pena in there, he's at 294. So it's been a great offensive club at 315. And you talk about some pop. There's one other guy that we have to talk about that we, we've waited to do just because he uh, he's off to a, a slower start. But it's sophomore Chase Mora, preseason All-American by the Writers Association, preseason player of the year in the Sun Belt. Big, powerful bat. Hit 17 home runs as a freshman for Texas State. Also tied for the team lead with 62 hits last season. And then how about 57 RBI as a freshman? He's just off to a really, really slow start this season but he started every game he'll be in there and you definitely have to keep an eye on him he's hitting 200 but those numbers last year and all the preseason hype definitely somebody to keep an eye on that is chase mora for texas state what i will say they've played a pretty tough schedule they're coming in at five and three but they also uh have really hit the the tougher part of their schedule uh right now and you've seen more losses Number five, TCU. They played Kansas. They played Kentucky. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they've they lost three of their last five when that competition has gotten a little stiffer, and they're going to face, obviously, really good competition this weekend, uh, having to face both Texas and LSU. It's a good mid-major club. It is still a game that LSU should absolutely win. All right. That's your preview there on all three teams. Let's talk a little bit about what we want to see from LSU 
as we as we um on our way out here on this edition of Moose at the Box. Number one, I want to see LSU stick to a plan at the plate. They're going to face some good pitching staffs. I mean, we just went through there. It could be very easy for it not to go their way early and then potentially get out of the way, especially against a guy like LeBaron Johnson. LSU, to this point, the best pitcher they've faced is Eddie Smink from, from Stony Brook. He had great stuff. He is not a true ace. LeBaron Johnson is a true ace, and LSU will see plenty of those true aces throughout the season, whether it's Hagen Smith, you know, uh, Carter Holton. There, there's, there's, I, we could go on, uh, Drew Beam could go on and on and on and on and on about who LSU is going to see. LeBaron Johnson is really that first test. Can you stick to your plan against him? Can you get to him? That is something I want to see. Not just get to him. Like, I'm not asking you to go out there and put up seven runs against the guy because that's probably not likely, but – can you, uh, you know, hold, hold court, keep yourself in the game while he's in there like you'll have to do on many Friday nights in the SEC? That's something I cannot wait to see there. Um, and, and for that nature, when you face all these great pitches, how does LSU hold steady for an entire game? Because we've went through the bullpens here. They're very good, all three of them, that you're going to see. So that's going to be huge. I want to see what Jay does with the lineup. Uh, I'm kind of expecting uh, Jake Brown to be in place of uh, Josh Pearson um, on Friday night, and we'll see how that goes. I love their lineup against Rice. Uh, I'd like, I would hopefully like to see if we see that one another time this weekend. I personally would like to see that one another time this weekend, especially considering some of the arms that they are going to face. On the mound for LSU, we've kind of gone through that a little bit uh, already. But uh, Justin Lohr, I'm going to throw him out there again. I'm still waiting to see him get back out there. And when I do, fastball command is something that I want to see more improved from him. Um, And you will obviously absolutely see him. But ultimately for LSU, can you keep doing what you're doing on the mound? Because you've pitched very, very well. It's a large majority of the reason you are 8-1 and one right now because even on days that your offense didn't have it, you can think back to the Central Arkansas game, you can think back to one of the Northern Illinois games, your pitching held serve and, and won you those baseball games, which is something we thought would happen early in the season. So can you just keep doing what you're doing now against heightened competition? Because you're going to play, obviously, a great Power 5 school in Texas and two really good mid-majors in ULL and um, and Texas State. I mean, the Cajuns were a tournament team last year, so that's, uh, that's going to be big, too. And then um, in keep doing what you're doing, I also mean, uh, you know, uh, keep those walk numbers coming down. You were great with that against Rice. And keep those strikeout numbers uh, going up. And LSU's hard to hit. I mean, when they're in the zone, they've got enough talent on, the, on this staff that they're really hard to hit when they are in the zone. And, again, how do they play in the moment? This is going to be awesome. Big crowds, big league ballpark. This is going to marquee matchups. This is going to be a huge test. I mean, this is going to prepare you. This is going to be as close as you can get to the NCAA tournament in March. I mean, that it, it is 100% that. So how do you handle that atmosphere? You've got a lot of veterans on this team, but you've got a lot of young guys on this team as well. So how does that mix kind of flow uh, with LSU this weekend? There was one more thing, and I didn't write it down, and I cannot remember it now. Um, oh, it's back on the mound. Guys who maybe have struggled a little bit or guys who you're still bringing along, how do they do this week? A guy like an Aiden Moffitt, right? A guy like Cam Johnson. I want to see how those guys uh, handle this atmosphere in particular. And I expect to see them at some point this weekend, but how does it look when they're out there? So, Y'all, I can't wait. This is always one of my favorite week weekends of the season is when LSU goes to one of these tournaments because you just learn so much about your team. And I'm not, again, I'm not looking so much for the result as I am learning about the team. I think LSU obviously drops a, a game this weekend, but looking at it, um, this is one that they could easily get two out of three. It very much feels like the Carbot Classic last week, uh, the Round Rock Classic last season, where you went into that going, okay, yeah, they could drop this one here, but I definitely feel good about them getting at least two wins this season. So that's my official prediction for LSU this weekend is two out of three. Um, if I had to pick one that they drop, it's either Texas or ULL. I mean, those are the two one. Those are the ones that I'm, you know, most skittish about. Getting a team like Texas State on the third day of this thing, they shouldn't have a lot of pitching left, and you should have a big advantage over them on a Sunday because of the depth of your staff. So either Texas 
or uh, or U L L is the game I think LSU drops, but I think they do get two out of three and complete a, a really nice uh, weekend homestand. I'll be there. I hope to see a lot of you there. If you see me, definitely say hello. Uh, hopefully, many of you are listening to this while driving to Houston. So, uh, again, if you see me, definitely say hello, man. Uh, I'll, I'm all about it. Love interacting, and that's what this is all about. So, uh, get subscribed to the pod. Smash the like button. Subscribe up to the YouTube channel. And uh, be here next time. We're going to recap it all on Muso at the Box.